Hi folks, welcome to RJ Impact. Today we're going to be talking about week 12 in the Balwani trial. Now since the jury were first chosen in week 1, we are now 14 weeks thereafter. But as we've had what seems like an endless break with nothing going on since my last update, although it's actually only been 2 weeks, truly this is actually the 12th week of trial activities. So I'm going to keep it simple and just count forward for every week of activities. Therefore in my book I'm calling it week 12 and sticking to that. Just to bring things up to date, there was one witness who was called late on Friday 2 weeks ago called Tracy Wooten. She was a licensed naturopathic physician from Phoenix and she testified that she'd sent her patients to get blood tests done at Walgreen clinics and just to sum up the whole testimony had a very favourable experience. Sorry but that was pretty much it. To me this would appear to remind jurors towards the end of the trial that okay there were some nice experiences here but what about those pregnancy and cancer tests that went wrong? Doesn't it just draw attention back to those instances where Theranos was not delivering? I don't know. So let's get to the trial from this week. We had a bit of a hiatus with the jury this week. When the week started, one juror who had symptoms of COVID, if not COVID itself, was let go. So we had the 10 jurors and three alternates left. At the end of the week, another juror was let go by the judge due to unspecified health reasons, so only two alternates left. This might be worrying if we weren't so close to the end of the trial, but surely the prosecution just wrapped up and we still have the defence to go, you might be asking. Well, the defence said that they would only be calling two more witnesses, so we are very close to the end. That is going to depend on whether the government calls any additional rebuttal witnesses, which they could well do. But I think next week, that'll be week commencing 13th of June, could well see the end of the trial. Over to the jury at that point. Oh, and associated with that, Balwani is not going to testify and unfortunately, at least for the spectacle of it, Elizabeth Holmes won't be called either. The judge had taken a look at the first defence expert witness declaration. Now, that is the basis upon the defence will examine the witness. Now, apparently, according to the judge anyway, the declaration is full of opinions that are outside the witness's qualifications. The judge had, in quotes, great concerns over this. Cooper Smith for the defence said that his questions would be narrow in scope, so essentially that should be okay. So not for the first time in this trial, there was another debate about the LIS. That's the database that had all the Theranos tests on it. And to cut a long story short, Balwani wants it to be discussed because he wants to argue that the data would show all the successful tests, and therefore individual instances of test failure should be seen as just that isolated incidents. Now the database is permanently locked as the de-encryption keys were lost so Palwani's team has submitted a number of DOJ emails in as evidence. The judge has previously warned that there should be no attempt to blame anyone, in other words the prosecution and or the government, for doing this in any way deliberately. Let's see where this goes. Yay we got our first witness in two weeks plus and the first defence witness this was Richard L. Sonia III. Sonia is an expert at recovering encrypted databases. Just as we were getting into his testimonies, one of the jurors had a coughing fit and the court took a recess. Good grief, what else could delay this trial? So anyway, back at it. We heard Sonia is being paid $300 per hour to testify, which doesn't seem too high to me compared with some of the lawyer's hourly costs. He discussed the different elements of the LIS, including a server, a data storage device, and a data server rack. Now, how all of this is particularly relevant is a bit beyond me at this point, but just for good measure, I've included generic pictures of the same, so that you can share my bamboozlement. Some storage devices, a server, a server rack. There you go, you're as clued up as me and the jury as to what these things look like. If you've any clue as to why that might help the defence, please let me know. So the testimony continued with Sonia saying that in August 2018, Theranos gave the prosecution copies of the LIS database on USB drives, but these drives were encrypted, and it wasn't until two years later that the prosecution realised this, and also realised that the data couldn't be decrypted. Was it the government's fault that the drives couldn't be decrypted, Sonia was asked? No. This sort of thing happens periodically in the industry, he said. After the defence rested, Bostick for the prosecution asked if the testimony is particularly helpful to the defence's case. I'm not actually sure if it's helpful or not, he replied. 
Me too, buddy. Then Bostick points to the government's original subpoena in April 2018, and this says, any person who withholds, alters, deletes, or destroys documents, including electronic documents, could be subject to criminal prosecution. He continued to pick at Sonia's testimony that the government could have tried to decrypt the database. Sonia admits he doesn't have first-hand experience of it. Good grief, why is this guy here? An email was then presented to court, and this was from CEO David Taylor in August 2018, where he asked Wilma Hale, the attorneys, to hash out what is needed to be given to the DOJ, as the system will be put into storage on Friday, and thereafter may be very difficult to resuscitate. Another email was presented, this one from March 2019, from Taylor. He wrote to prosecutors that Sonny Balwani and another individual encrypted the LIS database. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't locate this specific email. And just in case you're wondering, Taylor is the CEO that was appointed to essentially run the company after Elizabeth Holm has re had resigned. His job really was to see the winding up of the company's affairs. So there you go. It's somewhat puzzling to me why Sonia was called as a defense witness. There's clearly nothing that can be inferred about the database itself due to the encryption issue. And it seems to me that Balwani himself was somehow implicated in the encryption. For what it's worth, I think that Balwani's team are playing a long shot. If they can somehow claim that the database was the key to showing that all the technology worked, then perhaps, just perhaps, that's enough of a seed of doubt to prevent the jury from achieving that high burden of proof beyond reasonable doubt. Didn't you mention two witnesses, I hear you say? Well, yes, the second was going to be a paralegal who was going to be brought into the stand just to allow various documents to be brought in front of the jury. After the judge read the docs, this didn't happen. So that was it for the defence. A bit of an anticlimax, if I'm honest. Friday in court, away from the jury, turned to discussion over what the jury instructions would look like and what closing arguments could be made in front of them. One of the key discussion points that Judge de Villa won was actually in respect to the LIS. Yeah, no kidding. The defence would not be able to claim an, in quotes, adverse inference argument in respect of its encryption. They wanted to be able to argue that if it were found that the government, in quotes, negligently or recklessly failed to preserve the LIS database, then the jurors could infer that that was unfavourable to the government. The two words straws and clutching come to my mind at this point. We know that Bawani is still fighting the SEC civil claims against him, and if you remember Elizabeth Holmes pled guilty to those charges and faced a ban as being an officer of a company and a $500,000 fine. Well, the judge ruled that the jury would be instructed that these regulatory actions cannot be considered as proof of Bawani's guilt. It's interesting to me that the defence and prosecution argued about what order the judge would present this instruction. Clearly to me, I would think that the defence wouldn't want it presented to the jury at all, let alone what order it's delivered. So it goes, as Billy Pilgrim might say. So all witnesses have been seen. The prosecution said they wouldn't call any rebuttal witnesses. We are ready for closing arguments on Tuesday 14th of June 2022. Hallelujah. Well, that was quite a long-winded way of wrapping up the defence for Balwani. All in all, about two days, compared with the prosecution's 11 weeks. I hope you found this summary informative, at least. There really wasn't too much to it, was there? What do you think? Has Balwani done enough to persuade the jury to return a not guilty verdict? In my opinion, it's all going to boil down to the closing arguments. Oh, please hit the like and subscribe button, and if you hit the notification bell, you won't miss out on the wrap-up and final verdict. Bye for now.